Hi, welcome to Life on the Rock. Tonight our guests are from Project Rachel. We have Vicki Thorne and Jason Jones. They'll be speaking about the work of Project Rachel. Rachel, it has a healing ministry to post abortive women. And especially uh, tonight with Jason, we're going to talk about, too, the effects on the man, mm -hmm. the post-abortive father. So it uh, be a great show. Doug's leading tonight. Uh, yes. Good to see you. And you what are we doing this weekend, Doug? We've got a big thing coming um, up here. We're taking buses to uh, Washington, D.C. with a bunch of young people. Oh, no, I'm sorry. That was Greg Robeson from last week. Yeah. Uh, no, we are going to be at... Uh, planes. Taking we're, planes. We're flying out to San Francisco, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, with the Walk for Life West Coast. We are going to be out there covering it uh, this weekend. We want you to come out there and take a look. Be part of the event. Walk with us. Be active. Be part of something much bigger than ourselves. And uh, it's going to be great. We're uh, always excited about this. It's a bittersweet event because we're doing it because of the tragedy and the horror of abortion. But the camaraderie, the coming together, forces uniting, you know, together, allies, you know, is uh, is always a is always a great thing. You know, mm -hmm. just get we got each other's back, so right. to speak, and and it's just always right. wonderful. Right. Yeah. And this year, there's some uh, pretty big changes in the Walk for Life West Coast. It's still in San Francisco, but now we're meeting at Civic Center Plaza. This is right in front of City Hall. It's a beautiful location, and it's right there in front of the government of San Francisco. It begins a little later as well. The rally starts at 12:30. There's an info fair at 11, where all the different uh, people from different pro-life ministries come and and tell about, talk about their their work, particular work. So we have a, a new time, new location, new route. Right? We're going to be going down Market Street and end this year, end at Justin Herman Plaza. But this is a traditional uh, parade route for San Francisco, the Giants parade when they won the World Series and everything was down this route. So kind of stepping up in the world. I, I know the organizers have really been working overtime uh, to make all these changes. So pray for them. Pray that things go off well. Pray for our coverage that it goes well. Doug will be out in the field uh, talking to pro-lifers. Oh, all they, the occupiers of San Francisco. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. But you're, you're up to it. Yeah. You do a good job with that. <laughs> and you uh, got to rattle some cages. Things. Yeah. You know, I thought we'd also mention this week, uh, this past uh, January 1st, on the World Day of Peace, uh, our Holy Father made the theme of his address, educating young people in justice and peace. And he said how important it was, uh, you know, this work that we all have this duty to have this attentiveness to young people, their concerns, the ability to listen to them and appreciate them. And it's not something merely expedient, but something that all of society should do, you know, to help form young people. And he says that, you know, this today, the age we live, he said there's a rising sense of frustration at the crisis looming over society. The world of labor and economy, a crisis whose roots are primarily cultural and anthropo anthropological. It seems as if a shadow has fallen over our time, preventing us from cl clearly seeing the light of day. So as our Holy Father always does, he always has such a, That's, he's in tune with the challenges, yeah. you know, that are, that are happening. But I know, Doug, you've, you've, your life's work, you know, has been with young people. So you obviously know the importance and value of that. Oh, the, just the formation, even of my own children, you know, watching their hearts, their minds, their, their passions, their talents be shaped and formed as they grow. And, and you know, to listen to them, to engage them, to communicate with them. Um, you know, I, I still love that saying, the youth of the future of the church. But I still want to go on record for the second part of that quote that, I never heard it until I started saying it, so <laughs> we'll try to clean this one if I can. The future of anything is only as good as it is trained to be. And so if our young people aren't trained, their hearts, their minds, their souls, mentored, taught, shaped, formed, what do we got? Right. You know, we're going to be formed in the MTV generation and that crowd or the, the Planned Parenthood approach, you know. Uh, it's destructive. It's chaotic. Right. Or is it going to be a godly approach? Is it going to be really reaching into the hearts and the souls and shaping and forming the passions, the talents, and, and helping to master those passions for the right reasons for, for, for God's design. And then we've got, uh, thanks be to God, we'll have a wonderful future. Right, and I know, Doug, as you often remind us too, that you know, the, the, the family is the first place, the first school in which this education of children happens. That's what the Pope is saying here. And he urges parents not to grow disheartened. You know, your role is so important. And that he says something beautiful, said, he said, may they encourage children, the parents, by the example of their lives to put their hope before all else in God, 
the one source of authentic justice and peace. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes things can get so difficult, we lose sight of that. And mm -hmm. God, I think, is sometimes He really brings us to our knees to remember, hey, you know, I'm the solution here. I am the one that we need to center our lives on. Right. But something I wanted to tell our young people here that the Holy Father in this, this document, he, he talks about with this education, some principal themes. And he says, one, is that you know, our young people need to be formed, educated in human dignity. He says, the first step in education is learning to recognize the Creator's image in man and consequently learning to have a profound respect for every human being and helping others to live a life consonant with this supreme dignity. He also talks about educating them in authentic human freedom. You know, not license, not this adulation of self. He said, only in relation to God does man come to understand also the meaning of human freedom. You know, something we all crave, especially our young people. And he says, when, young, when man believes himself to be absolute, to depend on nothing and no one, to be able to do anything he wants, he ends up contradicting the truth of his own being and forfeiting his own freedom. On the contrary, man is a relational being and lives in relationship with others, especially with God. He talks about that relationship between freedom and truth. And he, that leads into relativism. He warns against relativism, which isn't, as you point out, it's not the evil of relatives. Well, right? No, I mean, relatives are not evil. <laughs> but relativism could be evil, yeah. <laughs> he says relativism recognizes nothing as definitive, leaves as the ultimate, crior ultimate criterion only the, the self with its desire, selfishness, right? Truth unites us. And so real education must educate in the truth. And he talks about living by our conscience, that it must be a, a properly formed uh, conscience according to the truth. Then we can live in this freedom. And then I just want to jump to the end. He talks about the importance of educating in peace, which is the kind of the culmination of it. But he says, he gives a, at the end of it, he gives this rousing address to the young people. He says, to all and to young people in particular, I wish to say emphatically, it is not ideologies that save the world, but only a return to the living God, our creator, the guarantor of our freedom, the guarantor of what is really good and true, an unconditional return to God who is the measure of what is right and who at the same time is everlasting love. This is a big theme of the Pope. And what could ever save us apart from love? Hmm. Return to God. You know, He is the, he is the one. Unconditional return. Hmm. Uncondi disciples that have surrendered totally to Him. You know, that's got to be the great theme. And He tells the young people, never become self-centered, but work for a brighter future. He says, young people, you are a precious gift for society. Don't yield to discouragement in the face of difficulties. Do not abandon yourselves to false solutions which often seem the easiest way to overcome problems. You don't be afraid to make a commitment, to make sacrifice, to work, to choose paths that demand fidelity and constancy, humility and dedication. Be confident in your, in your youth, youth and its profound desires for happiness, truth, beauty and genuine love. Right, those are great themes that our young people, we need to champion these things. You know, we turn on the TV and stuff, our media, tearing this stuff down so often. Our faith champions these most beautiful aspects of our life. And they, most of all, they tell you, you can go out there and go for that. You know, have your faith strengthen you and direct and guide your life. And you can experience this fullness of truth and beauty and goodness uh, that's out there waiting for you. Well, we're going to take a quick break and we'll be back with Vicki Thorne and Jason Jones speaking about Project Rachel. So don't go away. We'll be back in a minute. And we're back, ladies and gentlemen. Hi, Doug Barry here along with Father Mark Mary. We are the Rock House Compadres, and you are watching the most important show you could be watching right now. I have with us here in the Rock House. Was that dramatic? Did you like to pause in there? That was nice, yeah. Anyway, Vicki Thorne, the <laughs> founder and top guru of Project Rachel. Yes. And uh, Jason Jones, you are the producer of Bella. 
Uh, and good to have you both on the show. Thank Thanks you. For having uh, us. Project Rachel, let's get right into it. A lot All to right. talk about, uh, a right. couple of very key important things we want to get to here. Tell us a little bit about, actually, let's get into your background okay. first, Vicki. Yeah. Uh, you're you're a mother of 712 children yeah. and 4,000 grandchildren. I mean, that's you know, what people tell me. That's that's <laughs> says mother on my forehead. Yeah. <laughs> With the pro-life movement, it's kind of like you have a lot yeah, of adopted kids I out do. there. Yeah. But seriously, you uh, married 40 years. 40 years. All right. And uh, how many children and grandchildren? We have six six children, four daughters, two sons, two granddaughters. Um, we live in Milwaukee, but the granddaughters live in Denver. That's kind of hard, yeah, but that's rough. we try to get out there as often as we yeah. can. Uh, and, and, you know, really, even in terms of my own, my own life, in terms of the ministry, as it led me, uh, I was a high school student when a friend of mine had an abortion before it was legal, arranged by her mom, um, down in a hospital. Turned out she'd already had a baby, which I didn't realize she hadn't told me that. Mm. And uh, this abortion really turned her life upside down. And it's one of the hard cases that we would say it turned out that her brother was father of the second baby, probably father of the first baby. The school we went to was a boarding school, day school. I was a day student. She was a boarder. I think her mother sent her there sort of out of protection, if you will. Mm -hmm. And, you know, over the years that followed Doug, she'd talk about it, and she always ended every conversation by saying, I can live with the adoption. I can't live with the abortion. Mm -hmm. And I went on to get a degree in psych. Can't say it helped me to know what was going on. Um, I, you know, I was like helpless. And, but it made such an impression on me. It wasn't something we were talking about in the culture at that point. It was just a little before it was legal. But it wasn't on everybody's chart yet. And, um, you know, went on as our, my own life led me. Uh, I ended up in, Minne in Milwaukee. And uh, the archbishop there was super supportive of this idea. But the idea came from the bishops of the U.S. And in their first pastoral plan for pro-life activities issued in 1975, so just right after Roe v. Wade, they called for a threefold approach. And one was to be involved in education, life, womb to tomb, the, the, the absolute wonder and beauty of all life. The second was to get people involved in the legislative process, to have a voice. And the third part was pastoral care for those that were facing a crisis pregnancy and pastoral care for those whose lives have been touched by abortion. Mm. Now, nobody was talking about it, but I became Respect Life Director sort of accidentally. I said yes to part of the job, and suddenly I had it all and uh, saw so, this piece. And, and who, who was it who hired? Was it a priest who hired well, you? Well, no, it was actually a layman that hired me okay. and brought me into the diocese. But the moment you were hired, they probably thought... They did, yes. Okay, good, here. It's a sucker, yeah. <laughs> and everything just This woman will, you know, we can just give it all to her. <laughs> that's what happened. You've got uh, mother written all over <laughs> her. So yeah, and I was only starting at that point, and I was just expecting my first baby yeah. when what, I said what yes. What year was that? 1977, when I when I was hired, okay. our daughter was born. I was hired in January. She was born in March, um, and I quickly became, you know, the whole thing, the the Respect Life Director, and saw this this call. And at that point, our bishop was new. We had Archbishop Weekland. I went to him and said, I want to do this, and he said, Whatever you need, we need this. And it took me seven years because there were no experts. I mean, there was nobody out there. And I met other women. I wasn't dumb enough to think one woman a case made. Okay, maybe she had some other problems. Clearly, there were familial issues. But, you know, it really was that awareness because then I met other women who were telling me the same sort of thing. But, see, the bishops knew about the wound because they're confessors. And every country I've been in, and I've been in 20 countries, the bishops and the priests know because you've heard confessions mm -hmm. and you've heard the pain of this woman and the men, but nobody was talking about the men at that point. And so, you know, it was really this call to say, how can we as church provide care? And we have everything we need. We have confessors, we have mental health professionals, we had doctors, we had spiritual directors, everybody was there. Um, how do we train them? You know, how do we bring it together? And, you know, even the story of the, the happening, it, it all came together in six weeks when the time was right mm -hmm. in God's timing. I had gathered all the people for a training. The archbishop was on board. All our priests were on board. Our Catholic Charities was on board. But I was missing somebody. And I was missing the who I call the automatic confessor priest. The guy who walks in the room, everybody knows he's a priest. He's on the airplane. He's hearing confessions. You know, everybody knows. Mm -hmm. And I suddenly knew who it was, went to a priest friend of mine who was helping me do this, and he said, I'm bringing him here in September, and this was good because he was coming from Rome, and this is going to be an expensive ticket. And so based on his coming to town, we called him. I said, do you think you could talk about this? And he goes, sure. 
and it was Father Bob Pharisee. Some of your people will know Father Bob, um, Wisconsin Province Jesuit who taught in Rome and has done a ton of things. The over automatic the confessor. The huh? automatic mm -hmm. confessor. Does it have a t-shirt made up with that on? Uh, no, but I should probably do that for him. I hadn't thought about that. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, based on that, That's we did great. a training day, and it wasn't until two years ago that something else I came to understand that happened. I invited the press, they came, they reported, they said, tomorrow we're gonna to break the story. And I was not going to tell people there was a ministry coming for six weeks. We were gonna get everything in place, we were gonna have a mass, it was gonna be a big announcement. And I said to the reporter, wait, don't tell people tomorrow because the phone will ring and I'm not ready yet. Okay, she seemed to understand that. And then in the morning on September 19th, 7 a.m., a radio station called, I wanted to do a live interview in 20 minutes on the front page story in the newspaper I hadn't seen. So I sent my husband out to come back with the newspaper. And I was right, the phone rang all day, but it wasn't the women, it was the press. And the story went around the world that day. Now, only two years ago. What, what was the, the like, in, in a nutshell, the headline, the, the story itself, what was going church, around the world? Church offers help to people who've had abortions. Okay. And that was like earth shaking because we have this incredibly strong prophetic stance that abortion's not good for men, women, or children. The fact that the church would be offering compassionate care like just didn't fit with what people thought. And that was why it was newsworthy. But the other reason it was newsworthy is lots of people knew people who'd had abortions. And that was actually the story of the reporter. She had a good friend who had an abortion who mm -hmm. was unhealed and she said, we have to tell the world. But it was two years ago in Lourdes that I found out something about that date, which was September 19th, which was it's the Feast of Our Lady of La Salette, the Consolation of Sinners, the Weeping Madonna. That makes me think of the, the gospel just last week uh, or so of, uh, of Jesus healing the leper and telling the leper, don't tell don't anybody. Don't tell anybody. The yeah. leper goes out and tells them, here you're telling the press, give me six weeks. I know. The next day, there it is. There it is. And, yeah. and it, you know, it has just exploded and grown. And the thing is that it is so much part of, of, of our message as church that if I come with a repentant heart, the Father Mercies is waiting for me. But there, there, is, a, there is a myth out there, uh, is there not, that there are people who believe that because the church is so staunch pro-life, oh, and yeah. the Catholic faith is the greatest defender Absolutely. overall of life from yeah. all, from as you said, womb to tomb. Um, but there are people who believe that th there's this overwhelming guilt and you can't get near the church if you've right. been involved in an abortion. Yeah because they're so strong against yeah. it. And yet, it really the opposite. It, it is. It, they're, they're the greatest arms open for arms healing. Open. Yeah. Well, and you know, Doug, one of the things that's unfolded over time is that in 1960, long before I was doing this, I was but a kid, all right? Um, pope John Paul II, who wasn't Pope at that point, wrote the book Love and Responsibility. And in there accurately described the aftermath of abortion for women, 1960. He was a confessor. He heard it in Poland. Mm. And then in the sections in the Gospel of Life, section 99, he, there's an invitation to women that says, you know, the Father Mercies is waiting for you if you come with a repentant heart. And there's people to help you. And nothing's definitively lost. I, what a beautiful invitation. And then Pope Benedict has reiterated that. It, the, the most succinct document on it is one called Oil on the Wounds that came out of a Congress in, in um, April of 2008. He takes what Pope John Paul II said in terms of the invitation to come to the Father of Mercy. And then he takes it a step further and he says to us, you have to be the Good Samaritan who goes and finds the people who need help and bring them to the church. Oil on the Wounds. Oil on the Wounds. What it's a great powerful. title. Isn't it beautiful? You got to be a writer. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I say that respectfully, of course, but yeah. that's, a, that's a great time. I mean, it just e evokes something yeah. inside of you of it healing does. and, of and healing. mercy. You know, and it was yeah. just such a beautiful experience of, of having him, again, reaffirm, but say to people, we all have an obligation when we're doing pro-life work to, to be, you know, there's a, someone says there's a difference between a true prophet and a false prophet. False prophet only tells you the problem so bad. Oh, mm. it's so bad. And the true prophet gives you the problem and the solution. Mm. And as church, that's what we do. You know, when women contact our office and they'll go, but I'm Catholic and I don't think there's any hope for me, I can say, oh, wait, on the contrary, the Catholic Church is the only mainline church in the world that has a ministry, mm. specifically for women and men who need to come home. And to see what God has done with this over the years is just so profound. So the year that it started, Project Rachel was? 1984. 84, and? And, and the next day it went around the world. The next day it went around the world. <laughs> yeah. And it's and been nonstop since nonstop then. Nonstop since. And, and primarily it's simply because the wounds are so great 
Yeah. And the healing is so necessary and, and, and so craving. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're craving it. Yeah. And uh, but but it's 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 exploding into other areas as well. And I know yeah. you know a lot of people are wondering, you know, Jason, producer of Bella, we're going to talk about Bella. Well. Mm -hmm. There's another reason why why you're here. Primarily, we're going to get to that in a bit. Got to keep the audience watching. Yeah, that's right. But <laughs> but but it's a very serious reason, and, and and you're really going to be speaking very very seriously about this, and, and very moving for a lot of people. But tell me this: the response of of the clergy as this thing got rolling. Oh, Doug, the clergy couldn't <clears throat> have been more supportive. And you know, there's a double grace of this ministry because over the years, I've heard the stories of the priests who are the Project Rachel priests, who say, you know. I'm a priest today because I became involved in this ministry. Mm. It's what I was ordained to do. And so the priests and the bishops have been just, around the world, have been incredibly supportive and open. Um, you know, sometimes it was the pro-life people. One of the first calls I got when I started, it was from an elderly man and he was very angry. And he said, how can you do this? I mean, you can't forgive these people. I mean, this is the unforgivable sin. He'd clearly drawn the light, line in the dirt. And I listened to him and I said, sir, can I ask you a question? And he said, well, sure, what is it? And I said, if this was your mother, your sister, or your daughter, would you really want them not ever to have a chance to be reconciled with God? And it was dead silence. Mm. And he said, thank you. And he hung mm. up. <laughs> okay. But that, that po the powerful piece of we're broken people. We're all broken people. That's why Jesus died for us. And for us as church to have this, this clear statement is so important. One of the other, the other myths that's out there is that people say, well, you know, the aftermath of abortion is caused by the Catholic Church and the pro-life movement because we make people feel guilty. Well, the reality is it's a normal reaction of a mother who's lost a child in a traumatic and unnatural fashion. It's the same you see in Ukraine. It's the same you see in Japan, same you see in China, Taiwan. It's the same wound. Hey, you were telling me that in these other, some of these other countries you've been to, you've seen, um, and, and not Catholic ceremonies oh, no. or rituals, but there's some, some ritualistic yes. thing that they do to try to deal yeah. with the grieving yeah. for healing Japan purposes. and Taiwan in particular. Yeah. Um, Japan since the 1950s <clears throat> has had mourning ceremonies in the temples and they have statues that are called Jiso, J-I-Z-O statues, that are around the country and they're used for this grieving. You know, they'll, people will bring a balloon, they'll leave a letter for the baby. Um, they're appeasing these spirits and in their belief system, reincarnation can't happen when there's been an abortion. And they see it as a serious spiritual issue. Same is true in Taiwan. There they're called baby spirit programs. So it's not unique to the Western world. It's a human response. And you know, just from science for a minute, women carry cells from every baby they ever conceived the rest of their lives, Doug. I can't it, forget. This is, yeah, this whole, you were explaining this to me before, and I'd never heard of this, the biological truth here. Let, let's let people really process and digest this. Explain this again slowly about how this <laughs> works, because this is cool. This is cool. This is really cool. This is cool. But yet, when you consider from the from the standpoint and the, uh, and the angle of, of abortion, right. it, 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 there's something devastating it's to devastating. it. It's devastating. So, okay. Yeah. It's, it's a phenomena that's got a long, long name for it that's called microchimerism. And it means that mothers carry cells from every child they conceive for at least 40 years. We, we haven't looked further than that, all right? They're active in her body. They're everywhere in her body. These cells are somehow transmitted. We don't quite know how. So they're not just in her womb. No, no, they're everywhere in her body. They find them everywhere. Wow. It's one of the tests we do now, you know, in terms of all the reproductive Who's, who's healthy and who's not, they can find these cells in the woman's blood bloodstream five weeks after conception. That's oftentimes, that's before I know I'm really right. pregnant, all right? I'm right. still on the edge. So they're there, they're present. As a mother, I pass those cells on now to all my other children, all right? So all my living children carry cells of any, any deceased older brothers and sisters. There's biological knowing. That's so incredible. You know, when you think about this hmm. in terms of the Blessed Mother, Mary truly was tabernacle of Jesus. She carried his cells. There's nothing, why would, you know, why would God say in this one case it isn't gonna happen? No, she was truly tabernacle. And that's so beautiful when you think about it. You know, our children carry our cells as mothers. So there's this ongoing kind of communication that may well be there. Um, fathers are also changed by pregnancy. 60 to 80% of men will have symptoms with their partner. They sometimes know she's pregnant before she does because there's a change in scent and she smells different. And then six to eight weeks. Well, he may yeah. know she's pregnant just because moods are changing. No, no, no. This is before she knows. <laughs> Something's not going yeah. on. Right <laughs> what is wrong with her? She is really crabby. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's some science to this. It right, isn't right, just no, that. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true. Right, right. Um, but, but then six weeks before the baby comes, men undergo enormous hormonal changes. Mm. 
testosterone drops, estrogen goes up, making him kinder, more protective, cortisol to make him more protective, another hormone that's uniquely male that makes him bonded, really bonded now, and right before the baby comes, he gets the nursing hormone prolactin, and it lasts for at least six weeks, and it makes him extra kind, tender, protective. How beautiful is this? And then when his hormones go back to normal, his testosterone never again goes as high as it was when he was a bachelor. God has hardwired men to be fathers. And there's some ongoing research now about whether it's actually brain, new brain growth as well. There is in, in primates. Um, so I'm sure that, that, that's really getting personal. Yeah, that, <laughs> that, that opens up a whole new series of jokes when you think about yeah. men, <laughs> men having brain growth. Yeah. <laughs> we get busted on so much. So I know. Not see, any yeah, all, we can we can edit that out if we yeah. have to. You know. <laughs> kids, I'm a genius. I know. See, I know. <laughs> but it only lasts until they get mature. Oh. So you better use it while you got it. <laughs> but anyway, that you know, the point is that God made us in such an awesome fashion. Um, that when when something happens that deviates from how God intended things to happen, mm -hmm. there's consequence. Well, it's, it, as the saying goes, wherever you have order, you have peace, and wherever you have disorder, you have chaos. Yeah, exactly. And so the disorder, obviously, when it comes to something as profound and sublime and, and awe-striking as, as uh, life and, yeah. and being co-creators with God, when that gets out of order, yeah. on all levels, emotional, spiritual, yep. natural, we're going to have issues. Issues have are problems. there, you know. The Project Rachel is, is not just for the ladies, though. No, you're, because, you're, which is one of the right. reasons Jason's, Jason's here. Is here. You're, you're finding out another little teaser for the audience, but you're finding <laughs> out more and more now, and we're seeing more and more uh, men are speaking out. And, and is it true that men, for the longest time, we've been kind of set to the side in the, in the area of abortions? It's her choice; she can do what she wants. You have nothing to do. You were just a donor. Yep. And you're out That's of right. this now. Right. Um, and, and men themselves didn't know why they were getting upset and, and, and because we didn't know about the biological no. aspects as you just described. But even the spiritual aspects of the desire to be a father, to be a protector, right. and to be excluded from this is so painful by itself. And you know, one of the myths is that men are just donors. One. The second one is all men are forcers, that all men say to her, oh, honey, you should have this abortion because. And the reality is that's not true at all. There are so many pieces of men's stories, the men who would have stopped it if they could have, who wanted that baby, who said they would marry her, would raise the baby by themselves. The men who are told who would have said stop by friends, family, oh, you can't say anything, you know, it's her choice. The men who, who agree, wouldn't force necessarily, but agree, and then later say, what did I do? I lost my baby in this. The men who do force, okay, there are those guys. There are the guys who find out after it happened. There are men who almost lost a child to abortion. Um, I encountered a guy about six months ago. It was a story, it was a scenario I hadn't thought about. Just adamantly pro-life, and I, I said to him, why? You know, what's going on? And he said, because I impregnated a girl in high school, and, and her mother tried to force an abortion on her, and I tried to stop it. And he said, she had the baby. We didn't marry, but I know where my daughter is, and I know where my granddaughters are. Wow. It, was, it was the most moving thing, and it was an accidental meeting um, that just sort of happened. But this awareness, for every abortion, there's a father. You know, we've got more than 50 million abortions in this country alone, 50 million a year in the world. And for every abortion, there's a mother, there's a father, there's two sets of grandparents, there's siblings, there's all these people in this, in this, um, this experience, and we don't think about that. Do you think it compounds it for men in, in one sense that men don't seem to be nearly as much the natural, um, let me open up and talk about my feelings. Yeah, absolutely. And so while women can oftentimes get together, yeah. and I love this about, you know, on the humorous side, women and men, the difference is women get together and, oh, how are you? Oh, and they hug, and oh, yeah. your shoes are cute, nice sweater, great That's hair. Right. Yes. I never get that, but, you know, <laughs> but when guys get together, hey, how you doing, man? It's a handshake and a slap on the shoulder. Hey, we hunting and fishing. Did you yeah. rebuild your That's engine? Right. You know, you sure. still working out, uh, you know? Yeah. But it's different. There's, there's not necessarily that, oh, how you doing? How how you feeling right now? And you know why? Because the part of your brain where you're, you're emotions sit is in a totally different part than it is in women. Yeah, and I'm okay with that. Yeah. I don't have a problem with the differences. <laughs> I'm not going to say, Jason, that's a great sweater. I'm not going to do this, you know? It's not in I me that I can say way. that. Jason, that's a great yeah. sweater. <laughs> you know, and, and he's not going to compliment my hair no. again, the hair. Yeah. <laughs> but the point is that when it comes to a serious issue like yeah. this, men kind of get left off on the side of the yeah. road and because don't we, we, don't, we, talk we don't even it. know how to come out and talk There's about no words. That. Yeah. You know, this is a loss that's at the essence of who you are as, fa as man, right. okay, father, protector, and it's gone. 
And how do you make sense out of that? How do you put words to that? You know, I think about that because here I am um, in my life, and you know, I have five beautiful children. We have seven, two miscarriages, my wife and I lost, but five beautiful children, and they all still live at home. Um, they're 37 to, to 28, and they all live at home. No, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> they're 19 to 11. Oh. But I, they will still be. I'll just <laughs> tell you, at the other, yeah, they'll still be there. And just yeah, and that. I'm okay. You know, yeah, they, okay. They, they, they work for me, with me, in my ministry and all, but, but I go to bed every night, and I, I lay down the perimeter of my home. Are the doors locked? Are my, my, my guard dogs, you know, you know, guarding the perimeter? Mm, that's right. Do I, do I got the barbed wire lit up, you know, whatever. But I, I bless the home, mm -hmm. a little holy water here yeah. and there, and then I lay down. And from my perspective, I'm looking down that hall, that little nightlight down the hallway, and I just, I don't go to sleep so readily. Mm -hmm. There's always that one ear open, yes. or listening, that one eye open. I'm here to protect the home and my family. That's right. And they sleep better when I'm home. Oh yeah. You know, because they, they know dad is that, you know, yeah. you know, on guard. On guard. To lose that child then, yeah. to know that you were in some way part of it or stood back when maybe you yeah. should have because someone told you stay out of it. Or you got pushed away. Or pushed away. Uh, it's, it's and then you don't know way. how to bring that out. And yeah. we're, we, we're, we're, we are wired to protect. Yeah. You know, I, yeah. I, 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 just, I just can't for the life of me, um, Imagine what, what it might, might be like for, for so many men out there who still have not found anything, anybody, yeah. anywhere at all to yeah. tell them that they can talk about this and I they know. can find healing. I know. We, you know, we've been blessed in that we were able to do two conferences um, in, in about two years, three years ago, one in San Francisco and one in Chicago called Reclaiming Fatherhood. Right. And it was an amazing thing. But to see how these men told their stories, and Jason shared his experience at one of these. Um, but it was the first time anybody talked about men. And it, we got front page story in the Los Angeles Times. We had a cover story in The Nation, which is hardly a pro-life magazine, because there was someone who came who clearly knew someone. Mm -hmm. And people recognized this is the forgotten story. Hmm. That all, there are all these men carrying this enormous burden They've never told anybody, many times not their wife even, okay? It's, it's the soul wound that they carry inside them. And so for us to even have this opportunity tonight to talk about this, knowing there can be people touched, but knowing God's bigger than this. Right, right. And the healing that comes is so profound. Well, that being said, I, I think we've kind of laid down the groundwork yep. and we've set this uh, TZ audience. And if Jason, you have quite a story. Your father of six kids? Six. How many, how well, long have you been married? but yeah, six. Okay, how long have you been married? Uh, five years. Five years. Six, well, six years now. Okay. And um, producer of Bella, for people who know the, about the movie, I mean, it sounds, wow, the guy's out in, you know, Los Angeles, you're, you know, you're, you're interacting with, with Hollywood, and, and, but you've got, you've got a, quite a story that has to do with everything we're talking about. Why don't you just tell us what's going on? Well, yeah, I think my story is normal, mm -hmm. you know, it's, uh, it's all too common, and but I was not raised Catholic. I'm a recent convert, and I never knew about the abortion issue growing up. But when I was uh, 17, it was actually a few days before my 17th birthday, uh, it was a Saturday morning, my high school girlfriend woke me up, looked me right in the eyes, and said, I'm pregnant. And that caught my attention, and I was wide awake, and we spent that morning trying to figure out a solution to the predicament. And what we came up with was that on my birthday, I knew that I could join the Army because I had a friend who just joined at 17 who dropped out of high school. So I said, on my birthday, I'll join the Army. You can hide your pregnant from your father. She's like, I'll wear baggy sweaters and take vitamins. And that was our plan. And that's what we did. On my birthday, I went down to the recruiter's office. A few weeks later, I was off to Fort Benning, Georgia. Uh, my high school girlfriend, for her part, she wore her baggy sweaters. And as her, she took her vitamins. And it was just a few weeks before I was to graduate from basic training and come home. I didn't go to church. I wasn't a Christian. I was an atheist. If you asked me what my religion at the time was, I just said I was an atheist. Now, when you came home, your plan was to come home. Take <clears> off <throat> the sweater. Yeah. I'm pregnant. Her, you know, ta-da, we're getting married and okay. we're going to so we're gonna live. I have a job. Right. I'm in uniform. Right. You know. Okay, yeah, good. That was the plan. And a few weeks before graduating, it was a Sunday morning, I was cleaning pots and pans on a, a detail that I had, and a friend came running in, a really interesting guy, he was traveling, he was one of the traveling Irish, just a neat guy, and I'll never forget him, and he came running in, he said, Jones, your girlfriend's on the phone, and she's crying. I ran out, I answered the phone, and Katie was crying like I've never heard a woman cry in my life, and the only way I can explain it is that her soul was crying. 
And she kept saying over and over again, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And then her father said, Jason, we know your secret and your secret's gone. You can come home now. I took Katie to get an abortion. As soon as he said the word abortion, uh, a drill sergeant hung up the phone. I wasn't supposed to be out there on the phone. And I, I hit the drill sergeant. I was crying, saying, call the police. I was just, I was hysterical. Another sergeant pulled me by the collar into my captain's office. My big army ranger captain began to cry just at the sight of me crying. And I was just, sir, please call the police. My girlfriend's father killed my baby. And he looked at me confused. And I, I said, you know, sir, you took her to have an abortion. And he, he said, why would I call the police private? Don't you know abortion's legal? And I didn't. What year would this have been? I was 17, and this was in <clears throat> 1989. Okay. Uh, spring of 19, early, early spring of 1989. I didn't know. I was 17. I was a bad student. I was last in my class out of 565 students before I dropped out. I did not know abortion was legal. My captain gave me the Cliff Notes explanation of legal abortion, he gave me a roll of quarters, told me to go call Katie. And I called her, and I'll never forget, if you remember pay phones, when you, hit, you run out of change, it says you have... 60 right. seconds left, please deposit change. And Katie was still crying, and I had no more change left. And I thought I have to say something to comfort her, anything. And I, I just said, Katie, I promise you, if it takes me the rest of my life, I will end abortion for you and our daughter. And how I know our baby was a girl is the abortionist said to Katie, uh, uh, if you want to know, your baby was a girl. And so that's how I know our daughter. We named her Jessica. And so I made that promise as a naive 17-year-old high school dropout. But from that day until this day, I've tried to keep that promise, just left foot after right foot, left foot, just small things that I can do. Mm -hmm. Started knocking on doors, going door to door outside of Schofield Barracks in Hawaii on my days off talking to people. Uh, started running political campaigns. I met Vicky while running a campaign in Wisconsin and making movies like Bella just to try to make that promise. I'm now on the board of Personhood USA. And why that means so much to me is what the Personhood movement is trying to do to me there's it's all sorts of controversy around it, but for me, it's just telling the fundamental truth that my daughter, Jessica, was a human person mm. that deserves full legal protection. Now, her, her father wasn't very happy about this, was he, when he found out she was pregnant? No, and he was a very public, devout Catholic. Do you know, he's been since repentant. Eduardo, the star of Bella, and I were in Rome, and we went to the Scavi, and we, we had a mass, and we had a special intentions. And I had two, one that my mother would become a nun, <laughs> and the other that Katie's father would repent. And a year to the week, it might have been a year to the day, he called Katie and repented and, and said it was a mistake. Hmm. And he was sorry. And that, and that meant a lot to me. That's just a miracle. Are you still in contact with Katie? Yeah. And in fact, Vicki's worked with her. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. But your, your reaction... And you, when you met him, he was he was a bit on the rougher side. Yeah, he, he <laughs> left something out that he might want to put in there because it that? sort of fits with a lot of other guys. What's that? <laughs> okay. Well, I, leave out. I was troubled young man. Ah, yes. <laughs> yeah, I was but an atheist pro-lifer. I was the rage thing when is I met Vicky. I got so yeah. mad at her. Yeah. You know, I'd do these pro-life conferences, and people wouldn't vet me. They thought I was Catholic or evangelical. I'd speak at churches, but I was an atheist, but very pro-life. And nothing would make me more angry. I never told my story for 11 years. It was when speaking to a group of young people and a girl began to cry and she crossed herself and hunched over. And her body language told me she had an abortion. And then I shared my story for the first time. And the response of the people made me realize I should share my story. But nothing made me more angry than when I heard men say they were post-abortive and hurt by abortion. It just made me so angry. And Vicky was sharing with me that men are hurt by abortion. And I remember I said, Men don't get better by licking their wounds. They get better by burying their claws. And I said, I don't want to go and have men compliment me on my sweater and ask me to talk about my feelings. <laughs> like abortion's never hurt me. It hasn't hurt me. And what are you talking about? This is nonsense. Men aren't hurt by abortion. And, and Vicky said something that really devastated me. She said, men explode. Women implode. And I looked back at that time. It had been over 15, 16 years of my life of knocking on doors 40 hours a week on my off time, running political campaigns 80 hours a week. People wondered, how was I doing all these things? I was driven by this rage. Mm -hmm. And in college, I got kicked out of two dorms for what I call uh, uh, unorthodox pro-life tactics. You know, if someone said they were pro-choice. <laughs> Let me guess. <laughs> you dealt with it this I way. jumped over the couch and I hit them. That was it. And I, unorthodox pro-life tactics. <laughs> and I was just 
<laughs> and in the Army, I had five Article 15s. You're supposed to get kicked out of three, but I was 17 when I joined. I think that just was the young man that they knew had issues, and they were very... And for the viewers and listeners, Article 15 means? It could be like a misdemeanor felony, depending on the seriousness of the... Of the th and I was just angry. And it never dawned on me until Vicky said this, that I was being propelled by anger. I was speaking in Fresno recently, and a friend of mine heard my talk. He was in the military with me. He was in basic training with me, and then he was in my duty station. And he said, Jason, everything makes sense now after hearing your talk. You were a different man after basic training. He said, in basic training, you were the warmest, friendliest guy. I mean, you were what made, you'd wake up singing, God forbid, Brian Adams every morning. We'd have to listen to you singing, <laughs> Brian Adams. It was 1989. <laughs> Forgive me. And he said, when we got to my first day in my duty station, I started a fight with a corporal. And, and it was that anger and that protection. So you weren't a fighter. You weren't aggressive like that before. Not really, not to that extent. Not like that. Something had changed. I mean, not, I was always not in a, little, a I was a boy. Way. I mean, I was always rambunctious, yeah. but but it was that protection thing. I, I you know, when you talk about um, your children sleep better when you're home, my five year old tells me, "Daddy, when you're traveling, I don't sleep. Mm -hmm. I stay up the whole night." Of course, he sleeps, but um, yeah, so it was that I couldn't protect, and I remember feeling helpless. I'm in Fort Benning, Georgia, walking back from the PX under those this, the blue this canopy of you know the Georgia sky and those stars. And I felt helpless that my high school girlfriend was alone at home in her room. I could just picture her. My child was gone, and I felt utterly helpless. And so for me, it was really a vendetta to defend the dignity of my child. So when you, when you met Jason, it, was it a pro-life event? I don't know. I was I running know. a campaign. He was running a campaign, and somebody, we had a mutual friend okay. who said, well, you should talk to this guy. I know. <laughs> I, the, I get a lot the, of that. The friend, you know, I bet you do. The, yeah. the friend, the friend knew he was a little bit on the on the edgy side. Yeah, well, he, but we were all some of the unorthodox the pro-life <laughs> tactics. Yeah. yeah. Well, no, I was not aware of those at okay. the moment. I, okay. Yeah. Later that unfolded. But, <laughs> but when when you met him and talked with him, you could see there was something in here. Yeah. Well, you know, I had had other people, other guys I knew, even some in our extended family, who I had I had seen this before, and I'd seen the pain coming out as explosion rather than implosion. And I recognize it. You know, you do this work long enough, you mm -hmm. sort of, God gives you this little intuition about yeah. what's going on here. But it was clear that there was a drive there and there was something that was really propelling this whole thing. You know, it's, it's normal. There's a song, it's called Abortion by Kid Rock. And when I first heard the song, Abortion, it broke my, I broke down and cried because I identified with what Kid Rock was singing about. Now, Kid Rock is not who you'd call your typical pro-life spokesperson. Yeah. He fought for that song to be in the album. Virgin wa didn't want it in there. And it's the story about how the abortion that he was involved with as a young man, I think he was 17, drove him to alcoholism, drug abuse, violence, and that the only reason he didn't kill himself, now this is Kid Rock, is because he didn't want to see his child because he thought his child would judge him harshly for being involved in that abortion. He wrote wow. two songs on that. And he had to fight his label to keep the song on there. So I'm really, I admire his, I admire his integrity. Yeah. But so I think it's really typical and when Vicky told me, so for men to react that way, we look at some of the problems we have in society. But then for me to think about women, for all the activism, from knocking on doors to making movies to running political campaigns mm -hmm. that was flowing out of me, for a woman that's going in. Mm -hmm. And that to me is what's really heartbreaking. Yeah. That, you know, that I know how I've been driven and I know how I'm driven. And to think that that's going outward. And I remember I didn't want to convert when I assented to the truth of Christianity first before Catholicism. I didn't want to convert because I said, I don't want my anger to go away. I was aware that I was very angry and it made me work hard. And I didn't want to be like these lazy Christians that I'm around all the time. <laughs> Hold on. He referenced you and me when you sit with his hand. No, I, just, we, I don't want to leave Father out of here. <laughs> well, we're, we're sitting you know, Catholics chair. to me were the worst. <laughs> Catholics to me were the worst. I'm like, oh my gosh. I'll but, 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 but seriously though, why did you see Christians as lazy? I just, you know, they didn't have a sense, to me, they didn't have a sense of urgency. And I'll, I'll they never were jumping over sofas to punch people. <laughs> yeah, so they were lazy. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Alan Keyes, Dr. Alan Keyes came to speak in Hawaii and I talked to him. And at the time, I was chairman of the Young Republicans. I had a radio show. Um, I was uh, working for Hawaii Right to Life and I was working for a state representative and I was trying to hold every job I could that could in any capacity help end abortion. We couldn't even get partial birth abortion heard in a committee in the Senate, in the state Senate. This was in Hawaii. And Dr. Keyes was there. And I asked Dr. Keyes, I said, Dr. Keyes, I feel like all my work is just going to waste. What, you know, to me, he was my hero. I said, what do I do? What should I do? And he said, Jason, the darker the world becomes, the further your light will shine. Just pray. 
And that was, just pray. What is it? That's not what I'm looking for, just pray. You know, but I said a prayer. And you know, I look at my life since that prayer, it's changed everything. This was a prayer that I said, very corny prayer. I said, God, if you exist, and I don't believe you exist, I don't believe you're real because of all these things that are happening in the world, especially abortion. Prove to me that you're real. Prove to me. I need rich people, famous people, and powerful people to stand up and fight abortion. Where are they? It's me and a couple elderly ladies in a little office in Honolulu, Hawaii. <laughs> I need famous and powerful and wealthy people. And I said that prayer, and I started saying whenever I got mad. And you know, without blinking an eye, I can't even chart the course, how I went from there in just half a decade, in just five or six years, from being involved in producing movies with men like Eduardo Verastegui and Steve McAvity, working on two presidential campaigns and Senate can just there's no path other than God answers the prayers of atheists. <laughs> and I was flying on a plane with the senator who's now a governor who I was working on his campaign, a very good pro-life man, and I was looking at him across this plane. And I, and I had a letter of, of endorsement from Norma McCorvey for the candidate, uh, the Royal Roe versus Wade. I had a Bella screener with our marketing plan in one packet, and I was working with this man who's running for president. And I was on a private plane, high school dropout from Chicago, and I'm looking at him, and I thought, how did I get here? And then I realized that my daughter had been interceding for me the whole time. That there's no human way possible. Okay. There's no human way. And that's when I realized that it was together with my daughter that I had been working all this time uh, to promote the dignity of the human person from the very beginning. Now, Vicki, what, what, what Jason just describes about the rage or the anger driving him, um, I, I kind of refer to that sometimes as the crazy John the Baptist look in the eye. Yeah. That's something that just is, is always <laughs> ready it. to go. That's the look, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I, 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 agree, I would agree with you with regards to the laziness out there. I mean, I look at the divorce rate, the addiction rate, the abortion rate, the, the pornography problem with men, all these issues that men have. And it, for the life of me, I cannot understand why more men are not coming together when it comes to trying to help raise men up to be the warriors that we're supposed to be for whatever capacity or position God puts us in. Um, it, 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 to me, it's just, it baffles me. Um, but do you see this with regards to the abortion issue? Is this pretty common? Yeah. This, the, the, the fact that the guys who are able to, to begin to process it mm -hmm. become incredible advocates for life in different ways, okay? Um, I, I could, you know, give you a long list of people I've come to know, and they're all doing incredible things. Um, there's one who's a bank president, who's a, a very visible person in terms of some things. There are people who have been involved in, in theater. There are people who are businessmen. Um, there are people who do a lot of ministry, pro-life ministry. Their lost children bring them to that place. But you know, the things you just talked about, Doug, you know what, I can talk about that. Pornography, there's guys who swear they're not touching a woman again after an abortion loss and they get hooked on, yeah, pornography, mm. sexual addiction. Alcohol, yeah, yeah, drinking drugs to dumb the pain. Absolutely reckless lifestyles to confront death. And many of these guys kill themselves. Not necessarily some straight out suicides, some Just risk taking to the point of Just destruction. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the divorce. Um, I don't trust women, and maybe this is the woman I had the abortion with, but only 30% of those come, stay together and get married. But then we never talk about it. It's the elephant in the living room that destroys our intimacy. We've never forgiven each other. We've never grieved for this child. We're defended, okay? Or I marry another woman. Maybe she's had an abortion with someone else. I've had my abortion. We both get fragile. We might not seek help. You know, it becomes this destructive cycle. And so I think some of what we see in terms of the, the woundedness of men, and again, the things you were talking about, these things are all interlinked in ways we don't think about. You know, we don't necessarily ask men about, have you lost children to abortion or miscarriage? When we do therapy, when we did our conferences, that was one of the things we talked to the therapist about. Should be part of your screening question. We should ask women the same question. Have you, you know, have you had a pregnancy loss of some kind in your life like miscarriage, stillbirth, abortion, never start with abortion, too shocking. But to raise the possibility because once somebody's named it for me, like Jason said, it was eating you up and you didn't know that that was at the core of what was part of the rage. And for men, this rage issue can be a really, a really big one. Um, you know, we see suicides on campuses. You know, the bright young guy who jumps off the bridge and nobody knows, mm -hmm. such, a, such a loss. If the friends trust you, what you oftentimes hear was girlfriend, pregnancy, abortion, 
you know, he was never the same. And that's the stuff that isn't going to come out in your doesn't average mainstream out. press. Nobody talks about that. Yeah. You know, and we sure don't talk about, you know, the involvement of men in these things. Um, you know, even when there's an issue with a woman, we don't want to talk about it. Some of the things, the real brokennesses that are there. This is one of those things that's kept tightly under wraps in terms of, well, what would people think if we talked about the mm -hmm. impact? Because this is one of those freedoms that we need. Freedom for what? You know, this is a freedom that breaks people's souls and spirits. All right, we're, we're, we've skipped all the breaks for this show because this is so important. There's so much information. We're down to just the last five or six minutes or so. What do we do now? What, well, give us what you think, Vicki, and then Jason, you. What, yeah. what do we do, Vicki, to, to, you know, we don't want to be the false prophet and say only part of it. Um, I mean, Project Rachel, but tell the audience who's listening and watching right now, what can they do right now? See, I think the most important thing <laughs> is that when we talk about the value of life, we talk about abortion, to remember that anybody we're talking to may have had an abortion. The adamant pro-abortion, you know, provider, the, the, the activist, those angry people oftentimes have their own losses. And to say, and to be kind, to be, you know, to love people in spite of this other piece, but to know they may well be God's broken children here too. We always have to tell people there's hope and there's help and that there are people available, that there are, you know, there's, there's websites, there's books, there's places people can go to get help. Because if I tell you that for the first time, you know there's a possibility of that. And we can all share that with people. You know, we just have to be conscious that anybody we meet male, female, old, young, may have an abortion loss. Whether it's my child, whether it's my niece or nephew, could be anybody in the loop. But the reason the abortion issue is so impassioned is not because it's a moral and philosophical debate. It's because everybody knows somebody. I've been touched in some way. And if I haven't resolved it, there's a lot of anger and rage there. So that giving the word, you know, that there is help to people. Like we said, there's hope and there's help. Yep, and that's the important message. All right. All right, Jason, what would you say? What, what do we do? I mean, especially to men out there. Yeah, because men listening and watching right now, you know, there's some guys out there watching, listening right now. There's who, a lot of guys who out are, there. Who yeah, are just really, this is really resonating with yeah. them. Yeah, you know, as a man, it's to tap in, that the energy's not going to go away. The Kid mm -hmm. Rock sings about in his song Abortion that I was feeling. One hundred people are going to Google that right now. Mm -hmm. Kid, Kid Rock Google and the abortion, lyrics. Yeah. yeah, Google Kid Rock. <laughs> the, the lyrics are very popular. There's another yeah. song where he's got some edgy lyrics in there about the same experience. But I find that. I have a duty to my child, and that although I couldn't protect my child, I can protect children. You know, as a post-abortive man, I think we have a special, we have a special responsibility to protect the pre-born, which means vote. We live in a constitutional republic. Be involved in the political process. Vote pro-life. Support pro-life candidates. Support your local pregnancy center. That's the first thing you should be doing, because I thank God for these pregnancy centers like Heartbeat and CareNet and all these independent centers. Because I think my high school girlfriend asked her friend's mother for a prescription vitamin because she thought she needed better vitamins as her pregnancy progressed. That's how her father found out. Mm -hmm. If she walked into a pregnancy center, Jessica would be 22 years old today. Yeah. But support your pregnancy centers. Really get involved. Of course, confession, the sacraments, Project Rachel. Uh, this is what you do. But I say as men, we have to get active. We have a duty. We all can get... Bob, Bob Atwell, who you mentioned, who's the president of Nicolay Bank, these, when, as men who are involved in abortion, we'll never back down. You know, when I'm involved in a political campaign and I'm being massaged to support a candidate or a cause that's not faithful to life, it's never going to happen because I'm not denying the dignity of my daughter. Mm -hmm. And so I think post-abortive men, that's the first thing you need to do is take responsibility for your child that you lost to abortion by right. being faithful to that child through supporting pregnancy centers, supporting pro-life candidates, getting involved politically. And you've got, you've got a, a project coming up. We do. There's something coming out right now. We have a about. movie coming out that I did together with, uh, I'm an executive producer on with Steve McAvity who produced The Passion of the Christ. Mm -hmm. It's called The Last Summit. It's the story of a, of a priest and this man Juan, Pablo and Juan. It's, they really didn't know each other. They met briefly in life and okay. it's just one of the most powerful documentaries. And we have a trailer for it, don't we? We do, we do. We do, okay, all right. I'm gonna make sure we get to the trailer in time here. So let's go to this, check out this trailer. Uh, what's the name of the movie? It's The Last Summit. It's breaking records Last in Summit. Spain and it's coming to the States this year. And you all go right. to movietomovement.com, sign up and we'll tell you when. All right, check out this trailer of The Last Summit. El primer descubrimiento es descubrir a Dios, la inmensidad de Dios. El estar en la cumbre para él era símbolo de lo que él aspiraba en su vida. El estar cerca de ese Dios al que parecía allí incluso tocar más físicamente. 
Guardia Civil ha encontrado hoy los cuerpos de los dos montañeros desaparecidos este fin de semana en el Moncayo. Sus últimas palabras son, he llegado a la cima. Pues está muy curioso que la cima realmente haya sido su cima en la vida también. ¿Cómo lo resumiría yo? Pues, pues será una especie de Cristo en la tierra. ¿no? Su vida vale la pena ser conocida porque hará mucho bien. Wow. And uh, where do they go again for more information on this uh, movie? www.movie2movement.com. That's 2to2movement.com. Okay, movie2.com. Okay, very good. And All right. For the men who've been listening or the, those who love them, uh, there's a website, menandabortion.info. It's M-E-N-A-N-D, abortion.info. Okay. Um, resources, information, some of the stuff I talked about in terms of the biology. Okay. Place to start, place for contact with us. Men and you know, abortion, abortion dot, dot info. info. Yeah. Okay. Info Man is important. Info. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Great Thanks work. For... God bless Thank you guys. You. Thank you. Thank Keep you. it up. Father? May our Heavenly Father shine His face upon you and give you His peace. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We'll see you next week.